got a nice little crowd here. Good evening, everybody. Thanks so much for coming out for our financial aid night. Um, I'm Jen Nectarline, college and career counselor here at the high school. I'm gonna do just a couple of remarks before we turn the program over. Uh, welcome to those here. Welcome to those live streaming on our YouTube channel at home. It looks to be working. <laughs> We're checking out over on our other device. So thank you so much for coming. Um, just a few housekeeping things before I turn it over to our presenter. I'm going to go ahead and get out of our slideshow here for a moment and um, show you guys a couple of things here. So when you go to the 100 and Central website, hcrhs.org, if you happen to have a smartphone here tonight, um, you will see our pop-up comes up with our link. So obviously our people watching at home have found that successfully. This is a way for our viewers at home to ask questions, they can click here on this financial aid night, ask a question, it will bring them to a very brief Google form. And those of you in the audience can use that as well. So as you're going through the program and Kristen, our speaker is speaking, we're not gonna take any questions during the program. Um, during financial aid night, we save them all for the end. So if you could just refrain from asking questions during it, Kristen will get through all of her slides. You have the PowerPoint. Um, she moves through them pretty efficiently, 14 years strong here at Central. She's got this down and certainly presents at a lot of high schools and is an expert in this area. So she'll go through all of that and then we will keep the live stream going. So those of you that are watching tonight from home, um, live. We are going to keep the, keep the um, Q&A live so you can watch that as well. We will repeat questions so everybody at home can hear. If after um, Kristen's formal presentation you would like to leave, please feel free. Um, but we are going to go ahead and take questions for, for a couple of minutes. What we do ask, um, and you can ask those of you in the audience, you can use this link. I'll be monitoring the questions over on my laptop, but you can also um, feel free to raise your hand as we approach the end and take questions. What we do ask kindly tonight is that we um, keep our questions coming just from the audience, from your seats, that when our program is fully over, we've stopped our live stream, we've stopped questions, that you um, refrain from approaching and creating a line um, with in-person, face-to-face, like face-to-face -face questions. So if you have a question, feel free to pop it onto our Google form or ask it during the Q&A. But if you wouldn't mind um, tonight not forming the lines, we would really appreciate that. A couple of other housekeeping things. I'm here on our central website. I want to draw your attention to a few things. If you go here to um, council, I'm sorry, I'm not, a, I'm not a constant glasses wearer, so the fogging is, is something very new to me. I'm, bear with me. Um, so under counseling and then college and career services, I want to draw your attention to a few things. You've picked up, hopefully, um, the PowerPoint handout, but the other pieces that Kristen may reference tonight are all going to be found on our school website. We just wanted to save some paper and passing, um, and we put a lot of them here. So if you go to our central website, Counseling, College, and Career, and over here to Financial Aid Information, you're going to find a lot of the pieces that Kristen references, plus much more. So we've updated this. The presentation from tonight, those of you watching from home, if you know someone who couldn't watch or could not be here, that will be posted to this section of our website very soon as well, okay? Another thing I wanna draw attention to is this link called scholarship information. Um, I am no expert in financial aid, that's why we bring Kristen here, but we do spend quite a bit of time talking with our students about scholarships, and a lot of that is gonna come after we get through the next few weeks. We are approaching our first big deadline for admission applications this Friday the 15th, followed then by November 1st, and then we'll start to push out some information to our seniors about where to find scholarships. We're gonna highlight a lot of these websites. We're gonna talk about ways to find scholarships outside of Central, and then we're gonna to start to give kind of a taste of what's gonna happen in February of 22 when we put out all of our local scholarships. So all of that will come, but for now, here's a great list to help your senior get started. Scholly is incredibly popular. A lot of our students use it, but there's a lot of great websites here as well. I think that's all I've got. So without further ado, Kristen's been coming to us for 14 years. She joined us virtually last year. We did not want to miss our annual financial aid night that we host every October. We're so grateful for her time and her expertise. Um, Kristen is coming to us from Monmouth University's financial aid office. Um, and again, please hold questions till the end. Use the form to pop up on our website or please save your questions till the end when we turn over to Q&A. Thank you again all for coming and I'll turn it over to Kristen Isaacson from Monmouth. Okay, 
All right, good evening, everyone, and thank you to everyone who's here in person and to those watching in your comfy clothes at home. Um, so, yes, tonight we are going to talk about all things financial aid. Um, so let's go over the things that this presentation will cover. We're going to first start with some tools and some terms that you should know uh, going through the financial aid process. We're going to do a high-level review of the 2022-23 Free Application for Federal Student Aid, or FAFSA. We'll take a look at some types and sources of aid, um, aid programs that are available. Um, I have some tips at the end, and I also give you tips throughout the whole program. So first thing that I want to tell you about is a website, studentaid.gov. This is the federal government's one-stop shop website for everything related to federal aid. You can learn about all of the federal aid programs through this website. You can complete your FAFSA through this website. If you decide to, you or your student uh, as parents, if you decide to borrow a federal loan, uh, applications are submitted through the same website and then there are tools and resources to assist uh, once you are going into repayment as well so it's really from the very beginning through the very end information um, on this website I tell people I use it almost every day so um, that gives you an idea of the wealth of information that's available so for my senior families that are out there, the 2022-2023 FAFSA, or Free Application for Federal Student Aid, became available on October 1st. So it is now open and now available for you to complete. Remember, my junior families, if I have any of you out there, um, you'll be doing this basically a year from now. So it's available. You want to know when you have to complete it by. What you'll need to do is check with the colleges that your student is interested in to see if they have a deadline for completing the FAFSA. Sometimes the deadline might work in conjunction with the admission deadline as well. So you do want to check, what are all the deadlines? Okay, put them in order. What's the earliest one? That's the date that I got to get the FAFSA in for 22-23. You're going to file a FAFSA each year for each student that you have in college. The financial aid process is done over every year, so you do need to complete one each year. And the FAFSA is student specific. It is not a family application, so it does need to be completed for each student that you'll have in college. And last but not least, you'll be using income from two years prior on the FAFSA. So that means 2020 income will be used for the 2022-2023 FAFSA. And I just want to point out uh, the little owl that's up there on the screen. Um, that's uh, the chat bot for studentaid.gov. It's an owl, name is Aiden, and when you go to the site, Aiden will pop up in the bottom right corner, uh, and you can ask questions, might help you get to what the information that you're looking at quicker, but just know that uh, that's available to you um, as well. For those of you that might be interested in completing your FAFSA on your phone, it is possible to do so through the My Student Aid mobile app. And I gave you a couple of screenshots to give you an idea of what it looks like um, when you are completing the FAFSA on your phone. It's very clean looking. You basically get one question on each screen as you move forward. You can track your progress. The My Student Aid mobile app is free. You can download it for Android or for Apple. And you basically, you have all of the functionality as you would if you were on a computer or a laptop. You can save, you can complete, you can submit the FAFSA. You can also use the IRS data retrieval tool. We'll talk more about that a little bit further on in the presentation, but that does allow you to transfer your income information directly from the IRS into the FAFSA. And like I said, you can track your progress. Also note that you can move between devices. Uh, when you initially start the FAFSA, it will ask you to set up a save key. And this is basically there for you if you can't finish it in one sitting, you have that save key. So when you go back in again, you can pick up where you left off and you can pick up on a different device. Okay. So. Ah. Why are we not moving forward? There we go. Okay, so some more terms that we need to know about moving forward in the financial aid process. So we're gonna be talking a lot about this free application for federal student aid or FAFSA tonight. 
And all of the information that you're providing on it, all of the data, all of the income information, asset information, household size, number in college, all of that information is going to be run through a federally mandated formula that's called the federal methodology. And it uses all of that information on the FAFSA to determine something called your expected family contribution. And your expected family contribution is a number, that's our output, um, from completing the application itself. So again, we're taking all the data that we put on the application, we're running it through this federally mandated formula, and it's giving us a number at the end that we call your expected family contribution. Okay, so what is the expected family contribution? Basically, it is a measurement of the student's and family's ability to pay for post-secondary educational expenses. And it's made up of two portions. There's the contribution from students. So if the student did work in 2020, if they have their own assets, that does have to be reported on the application, and that information will go into that expected family contribution. And then we also have the parent portion for those students that do need to provide parental information, and both of those will come together to provide, to, uh, uh, provide that expected family contribution. Some other notes on the expected family contribution, or EFC. Um, basically, in the financial aid office, we use your EFC to determine the student's aid eligibility for the upcoming school year. And it does stay the same regardless of college choice, because remember, the EFC was determined based on the information, the family information that was provided on the application. So once a student has their EFC, it stays the same for that school year. Remember, too, that the EFC is not necessarily the amount of money that you will pay for college, and nor is it the amount of federal aid your student will receive. Okay. Another term that you do want to be familiar with is something called cost of attendance. It's the overall cost to attend an institution for the upcoming school year. And it's made up of several different items. You've got direct expenses or expenses that are billed by the college. So things like tuition and fees, room and meals if the student's living on campus. Um, you have indirect expenses, things like books and supplies, transportation expenses, personal expenses. Um, if a student's living off campus, there can also be a, a home maintenance portion to the uh, indirect expenses as well. Um, why do we need this? Because we want students to be prepared for the overall cost to attend that institution. It's not just about having enough money to pay the bill. You need to be able to purchase your books and supplies. You need to be able to get to and from campus, and that can mean different things for different students. Transportation means one thing if your student's living at home and driving somewhere to campus, and it means something different if a plane ride is required to get them to the school they'd like to attend. Um, because there are times when they do need to get to campus and then come back home as well. So you do need to be prepared for that expense. And personal expenses are things like clothing and entertainment and soap and shampoo and things to have uh, to every day for living. So again, cost of attendance, overall cost to attend for the upcoming school year. And finally, financial need. As you move forward in the financial aid process, you will read about different types of aid that say this is a need-based program or it requires financial need to be eligible for this particular program. So we have to have a way to determine who has financial need and for how much. So we do this little equation that I have up on the screen. We're going to take your cost of attendance, so the overall cost to attend the institution for the school year, we subtract from it that expected family contribution. So the number that the federal government got from processing your application, that gives us the student's financial need. Let's put some numbers to some examples to give you a better idea of how this works. So let's say I'm looking at two different schools. My first school has a cost of attendance of $40,000. And in my example, my expected family contribution is $15,000 leaving me 25,000 in financial need at the first school. But I'm looking at another school, a little bit more expensive, so $65,000 cost of attendance. The EFC still 15,000, leaving me 50,000 in financial need at that second school. So in real life, what does that mean? School number one, I can get up to $25,000 in need-based aid, and at the second school, up to $50,000 in need-based aid if it's available. 
Not every school can guarantee to fulfill 100% of need for their students. Uh, those schools that do, it is prominent on their financial aid website. When you're researching you know, what types of aid might be available from that institution, you can Google colleges that fulfill 100% of financial need. Um, and those schools that can't guarantee to fulfill 100% fulfill as much of that financial need as they possibly can. Okay, so a couple more tools to make you aware of. One is a net price calculator. So if you'd like to get an early estimate of your student's aid eligibility at a particular college, I recommend using a net price calculator. You should find it on the college's financial aid website. All colleges in the country have to have one. Um, and what you'll do is provide some income information and then it will return to you um, uh, an estimate of the student's aid eligibility uh, for that upcoming school year. And it will also give you information about the cost for that institution as well. The link that I have there at the bottom of the page is a way to help make it a little bit simpler if you want to do a net price calculator for multiple schools. You can go to that collegecost.ed.gov website and then enter the name of the school that you'd like to do a net price calculator for and it will take you directly to their website. Um, you can't just enter the information in one spot and have it return it for a bunch of different schools. You do have to use each individual school's net price calculator, but that will cut down on the searching uh, for the specific site for the college you're interested in. My last tool is um, something called the Federal, uh, federal Student Aid Estimator. Um, this replaces what used to be called the FAFSA Forecaster, in case anybody recognizes that name or used that before. Um, and what the Student Aid Estimator does is lets you kind of do, I call it a dress rehearsal of the FAFSA to see information that's needed. And it's going to give you an early estimate of the expected family contribution as well as potential eligibility for federal student aid. I recommend this tool for juniors or any sophomore families that I have out there for senior families. You're going to be filing the FAFSA very shortly and it's going to give you when you complete it an estimated expected family contribution and the potential federal student aid eligibility. So really for senior families, you need to be doing the real one. But if I have junior families, sophomore families that want to get an idea, you can use the student aid estimator. Um, what, one of the things that it um, has improved over the former FAFSA forecaster is if you want to use the federal student aid estimator, you don't have to worry about setting up an account or having a login. You can just go to the site, enter the information, and then it will you know, give you, uh, return you the uh, information. Okay, so as we move into the FAFSA for 22-23, I do want to let you know about a couple of changes um, that are happening with 22-23. One of those is that failing to register with selective service will no longer affect a student's eligibility for federal aid. If you don't know what selective service is, it's registering for the draft generally required for males between the ages of 18 and 26. Now I do want to let you know, while yes, this is a change for federal aid, registration is still required for any student receiving any sort of New Jersey funded aid, whether it's a scholarship, a grant, or a loan. So some of you may have heard of the NJ Class Loan Program. It's a supplemental loan program offered by the state. Even borrowing that for your student going out of state, student is required to be registered with selective service. There's also a question on the FAFSA about drug conviction, and that too will no longer affect the student's eligibility for federal aid. Due to the timing that these items had to be put in place, you will still see both questions on the FAFSA, but again, the responses will not affect the student's eligibility for federal aid. So when we go to complete our FAFSA, we need a way to sign it. And we also need a way to access the application um, if we're going to need to log in again, things like that. So the way that we do that is through what's called an FSA ID. This is a username and password that both student and parent create. It's their access into the FAFSA. It is their legal signature on the FAFSA. And it's also the legal signature for any federal loans that might be borrowed. Both the student and one parent need an FSA ID because both of you have to sign off on the application for it to process. If only one of you signs off on it, it will not be processed. 
some things to keep in mind with the FSA ID. You will be asked to provide a social security number. Please make sure that it's correct. You'll also be asked for an email address and a mobile phone number. Please keep in mind that these need to be um, belong to the person applying for the FSA ID. So if the student's doing it, they need to put their own email address and their own mobile phone number. Parents, if you're doing this, you need to provide your own email address and your own mobile phone number. Um, and the system will know if you're trying to enter one that's already been used by someone else. Um, and why is that? Well, it, the email address and mobile phone number can also be used as the username, and they're also used to retrieve the password information. And so remember, this is all private information, and really um, FSA ID information shouldn't be shared and should only be used by the person that it's assigned to. Do you wanna let parents know if this is child number two or three in college and you already have an FSA ID, you don't need to get another one. That's yours. You can sign off on as many FAFSAs as you need to with that FSA ID. Just the next student that's going to college will need their own FSA ID for their FAFSA. Okay, so when we go to complete our FAFSA, you can use the link that I have at the bottom of the slide, or if you just get yourself to studentaid.gov, you can go to the menu at the top that says apply for aid. That's what I have circled. When it drops down, the first item in the list in the drop down is complete the FAFSA. And it will take you to a screen that looks like this. And what you'll want to do if this is your, if you're just starting the application is you'll want to use the start here button because that's under new to the FAFSA process. So that will start a brand new application. If down the road, after you've completed the application, and you've gotten confirmation it's been processed and you go back and you review it and you find a mistake or your student needs to add another school onto it. You can go right back to the same website, go under returning user, click login, and go right back into the application. Let's see. I do want to provide you with what it looks like when you're in the application. I gave you a few screenshots in the beginning of what the mobile app looks like. This is what it's gonna look like if you're on like a desktop, laptop, that type of computer, um, or even a tablet if you don't download that, the My Student Aid mobile app. So there's some things to know when you're on the screen and helpful information when you're actually in the application. If I start with my arrow in the upper left, that's pointing to the, the status bar. So it lets you know where you're at in the application. You get a green check mark when you complete a section. When you're working on a section, it's the blue circle. And then the ones that haven't been uh, worked on yet, they have an empty circle so that you can track your progress and know how much further you have to complete the application. The next arrow down on the left says student information. So the FAFSA uh, collects mostly student information, but there is a section for parents. So it's important to make sure that on the student pages, you put student information and on the parent pages, you put parent information. It's very important, and when it is parent information that's needed, it will say parent information then at the top instead of student information. So when can this become an issue? So parents, if you're sitting down to do this by yourself, and I will tell you that I do recommend that you and your students sit down to do this together, um, I just find that that's, that's a better working um, uh, to get it finished and get it finished correctly. But parents, if you do sit down to do this by yourself, what happens is you forget that the application um, always, whenever it says you and your, that's what one of my other arrows is pointing to, um, always refers to the student. And usually the demographic information is filled out correctly, but then you forget who you are when you get to the income portion. So then you parents put your income in the student section, and then you put it in the parent section as well. So then it looks like you both have earned the same amount of income, which would affect your student's aid eligibility. So again, make sure parent information, parent parts, student information, student parts. And finally, if you're not sure how to answer a question, what my final arrow is pointing to um, is that after, at the end of each box for your answer, there's a little circle with a question mark in it. If you hover your mouse over that, it's gonna open up a help box. So hover over that, 
read all the information and then that should help you answer the question that you're, you know, that you're stuck on. So know that that's available um, and there for you if you need it. Just some other eligibility requirements for completing the FAFSA. Students do need to ultimately earn a high school diploma or its equivalent and there is a place on the FAFSA to say if you're getting the high school diploma and then putting in the name of the school. In order for the college to award the student aid, they do need to be accepted for enrollment in an eligible program. Students need to be US citizens or eligible non-citizens, and they also need to have a valid social security number. So as we take our look here at the sections on the FAFSA, we start with the student demographic information. So all information about the student, their citizenship status, marital status, state of legal residence, also the level of parents' uh, school completion. So all information that should not be um, troubling or, or difficult to, to fill out. Then we get to the student dependency status section. This section determines whether or not we're putting parent information on the FAFSA. The way that it works, the items that I have on this slide and the next slide, if none of them apply to your student, then you're going to be putting parental information on the FAFSA. If at least one item does apply to your student, then you will not have to put parent information on the FAFSA. And they're all yes or no questions. We'll go over them, so then as I go over them, you can think in your head, yes or no for your student. So again, this has to do with the student. Were they born before January 1, 1999? Are they married, serving on active duty in the U.S. Armed Forces, or a veteran of the U.S. Armed Forces? Since turning age 13, were both parents deceased? Was a student in foster care or a dependent or ward of the court? Is a student an emancipated minor or in a legal guardianship? Is a student working on a master's or doctorate program? Does the student have children who receive more than half of their support from the student? Does a student have dependents other than children who live with the student and receive more than half of their support from the student? And is a student homeless or at the risk of being homeless? So again, if none of those items apply to your student, you will be putting parent information on the FAFSA. I know that some of these items sound a little strange for 17, 18 year olds, but remember there's one FAFSA, whether you're getting an associate's degree or a PhD, whether you're 17 or 70. So again, all the, the questions need to be there. Obviously, um, depending upon circumstances, you may answer things differently. Or parents, as you think yourself, if you went to college and were answering these questions, you would answer them differently from your student. So if we go, as we go into parent information, there are some things, parents, I wanna make you aware of so that you can be prepared for this portion of the FAFSA. You are going to be asked about your marital status and Unlike income information on the FAFSA, marital status is as of the day you complete the application. So we're using income from 2020, but our marital status is as of the day we complete the application. We have choices between never married, unmarried, both legal parents living together, married or remarried, divorced or separated, or widowed. So those are our marital status options going to give you some examples so that um, hopefully everyone knows who needs to go on the FAFSA as far as parents are concerned. So I have a student whose name is John, lives with both of his parents who are married to each other. Easy. Both parents go on the FAFSA, marital status is married. But let's say John's parents get divorced. John lives with his mother when they go to complete the FAFSA. The marital status is divorced. And then mom's information is what goes on the application. The FAFSA uses the custodial parent or the parent that the student lived with more during the last 12 months. It's not who claims the child for IRS purposes, not what your divorce decree says. It's the custodial parent. But now let's say John remains living with his mother and she marries somebody else. So the next time they do the FAFSA, marital status is now remarried. And then mom's information and the step parents information goes on the FAFSA. So step parents, yes, they do have to be reported um, on the FAFSA. 
they are not obligated to pay any college bills for the student, but that income is a resource in that household and it will be used to determine the expected family contribution. You'll also be asked about your household size. Um, please make sure that you've accounted for everyone. Um, you're going to have one or two parents, depending upon the marital status. There'll be at least one child, the one that this application is for, any other children that are in your household that you're supporting, and if there are any other people living with you um, for whom you provide more than 50% of their support. We also have number in college. It's always at least one for the student that's completing this application. Parents, also be prepare, prepared to provide your social security number, name, and date of birth. Always be sure to double and triple check it because it is uh, confirmed with the Social Security Administration, and if it comes back that it's incorrect, yes, it can be corrected, but again, holds up the process. And your state of legal residence. Okay, so when we go to work on the income portions of the FAFSA, the questions that are asked of students and of parents are exactly the same. So the income sections are exactly the same. Again, how you might answer them may be different depending upon whether it's student or parent filling out the section. To assist with the income items that are on the tax return, we have something called the IRS data retrieval tool. It's a way for you in real time to transfer income information from the IRS into the FAFSA. You'll authenticate your identity with the IRS, decide whether or not to transfer the data, and within seconds it will be transferred into the application. Now, I don't want anyone to um, uh, get worried if they use the data retrieval tool, which we recommend. Um, when you see the fields that it fills in, it's going to say transferred from IRS. You won't see the actual numbers. Why is this? It's secure. It's for security. When the data retrieval tool first became available, apparently there was some way that people could view your income information after it was transferred. So they had to tighten up the security. And so the way that they do that is by masking the data and just saying, showing that it's transferred from IRS. Um, in order for the income to transfer, it would have already had to have been verified, um, your income verified with the IRS, everything finalized with that particular tax year. So everything that transfers over would match what's on your then 2020 tax return. Now, realize that schools and state agencies, we do get the income information because we need that information in order to uh, perform our jobs. One thing I wanna make note of, joint tax filers, you are going to have to manually enter your income earned from work. Why? The data retrieval tool doesn't do math. It simply transfers information. So if you're filing jointly, it doesn't know who made what of the wages, whether some is for both of you, it's all for one, zero for the other. So those fields will be blank and you'll need to fill those in. You can use your W-2 to fill those fields in. Please don't change the data that's transferred over if you do. The schools we will know, because we'll be told on the information that we get, and you can count on us asking you for documentation as to why the information was changed. And also, do not update uh, the income on the FAFSA to 2021. Uh, it needs 2020 information, and that's the way that you'll complete it. My graphic here is just showing you that if um, you're eligible to use the data retrieval tool, there's just a... Um, bar to click on, and then it will um, bring you to the IRS website. Okay, so now we're getting to the end. We've just got a couple sections of the FAFSA left to do. So you may be asked about your assets. Like marital status, assets are as of the day you complete the FAFSA. So what could you be asked about? You could be asked, what do you have in cash savings and checking accounts? What is your investment net worth, your business or investment farm net worth? Again, as of the day you complete the FAFSA. So with cash savings, uh, savings and checking accounts, add up what you have in those accounts, that's your answer. Cash really is what's in your wallet, what's in your purse, do you hide stuff in the mattress, I don't know, add that all together. Investments, let's review some information related to investments in case you do have to report this information. So I'm going to give you the items that do not count as investments for FAFSA purposes because the list is a lot smaller than the items that do count as assets. So the exclusions from investments are the home that you live in, the value of any life insurance, 
and what you have saved in your retirement accounts. So those are the three items that do not have to be reported as investments. Home that you live in, value of any life insurance, what you have saved in your retirement accounts. Basically everything else is an investment. If you own another home somewhere, you own land somewhere, has to be reported. You own stocks outside of your retirement fund, those have to be reported. Money market funds, mutual funds, um, CDs, stocks, bonds, um, all of that is, a, um, is considered an investment, all as of the day you complete the FAFSA. One other item that's also considered an investment, your 529 college savings plan. So if I have anybody who has one of those, let me give you some information about how they're treated on the FAFSA. So we are looking at, with 529 savings plans, we are looking at the owner of the plan, not the beneficiary. So we want all accounts owned by your student and all accounts owned by parents. Um, or one parent, only the, if, if one parent's on the FAFSA, then it would just be that parent. But that's who we're looking at. We're looking for ownership, and we're looking at owner who is student or parent. And then the way that it works is that you're going to include all accounts owned by the student and all accounts owned by the parents for any member of the household. So if you have multiple children and multiple accounts, you do need to add them together and put the grand total on the application. I'll read that to you again. We're looking for all accounts owned by the student and all accounts owned by the parents for any member of the household. So that's information regarding the 529 plans. When you get through your, um, if you get asked about the assets, oh, one thing, businesses. If you have a family owned and controlled business with 100 or fewer uh, full-time employees, so a family owned and controlled business, 100 or fewer full-time employees, you do not have to come up with a net worth to your business. You'll also have a section on the FAFSA to list the colleges that you'd like to receive this information. You do need to list at least one, and you can list up to 10 colleges on the application at any one time. When you go to complete this application, if your student is still looking at more than 10 schools, here's what you do. Take 10, fill it up, let it process. You should get notified by email a few days later that it's been processed. Once you have that notification that it's processed, go back in to the website, log in, and then you'll have to overwrite some of the initial 10 schools with the ones that didn't receive it. So if you at 15, you put 10 on the first time, it's processed, you go back in, you have to overwrite five of the initial schools that received it with the five that didn't get it. And then uh, once you get the confirmation that second time around, then you know that all 15 of your schools have received the information. Okay. And then we get to the part where we're going to sign the FAFSA. Just pointing out here that you're going to, the student is going to sign it. In this example, this slide just shows that the student has signed with their FSA ID. Next step is for the parent. And then we have, um, it's offering parent one or parent two, um, which who are you? And then um, realize that only one parent does need to sign it, not two. There's only space for one parent to sign. You'll complete that. And then congratulations, you get to the confirmation page. That's how you know that you're done. When you've got that congratulations on it, you know that you successfully submitted the application. What I'm pointing at on the slide there is that if there is a sibling in college, you can click from the first one's confirmation page to go start the next one and it will transfer over parent information. So it helps a little with um, uh, having to re-enter information if you have multiple children. And also the confirmation page will list out all of the schools that were put in the school section and give you some demographic information about those schools. Okay, so congratulations, we got our FAFSA done. Because basically all schools are going to ask you to complete the FAFSA, but then they may ask for more than that. There may be uh, their own in-house scholarship application. So again, this is something to check with the financial aid offices at the school your, schools your student is interested in. What do you need me to fill out? You can find it on their website. Um, so they may have their own application or they may ask you to complete something called the CSS profile. CSS profile is put out by the college board. 
used by about 300 schools across the country. What is it used for? It's used for institutional aid. So schools that have significant institutional dollars want more information about you than what's on the FAFSA to determine who will receive those dollars. So they are two different applications serving two different purposes. There's also a charge for the profile, but they have um, increased um, the threshold to be able to file for free. So now families with incomes up to $100,000 can actually complete the profile for free. Um, so make sure, again, that any applications that need to be submitted get submitted and submitted on time. How do you find out how much aid your student's going to receive? That's through the financial aid award offer. So the way that the financial aid award offers work is that it would come from any school that the student listed on their FAFSA and that they've been admitted to. So back in my example, I had 15 colleges I was looking at and applying to. Yay me, I got accepted into all 15 of them and I put all of them on my FAFSA. So that means I should be receiving 15 financial aid award offers, one from each of those institutions. And that award offer is going to detail the types and amounts of aid that I'm eligible for at that school for the upcoming school year. Make sure that you're reviewing these offers, if there's any action that you need to take to follow any directions. Financial aid award offer could be sent in the mail, could be sent by email. You could access it through an, an online portal. That does vary from school to school, how they send out the actual information. You could also be asked to provide additional documentation. Um, both the state of New Jersey and the federal government um, and schools have a verification process, so you could be asked for additional information if you are. Just be sure to submit it as soon as you can to whoever was asking for it, because it does mean that your student's aid won't be finalized until that information is not only received, but then also reviewed. And if you decide to use student loans, the school will walk you through the student loan process. So as we're going through our aid process, we wanna make sure that we're applying to all sources of aid that we possibly can. We don't wanna lose out on anything. So we have the college itself, that's the institutional aid. And what do they give out? And how do I qualify for it? Do they have merit-based aid? So aid based on uh, academic merit. Could be grades, test scores, combination of the two, um, but generally not based on anything financial. Then a school could have need-based aid based on financial information. Schools could have one or the other, or some of both. So again, varies from college to college. So important to know what's offered by each institution your student is interested in, and then make sure you know how to qualify so again, you've completed all the possible applications that are needed. If you complete the FAFSA, you take care of all of the federal resources for aid. So the federal grant programs, federal loan programs, and the federal work study program, all taken care of through the FAFSA. If your student is planning to stay in New Jersey, um, the FAFSA also takes care of the state of New Jersey. The FAFSA information will transfer over to the New Jersey Higher Education Student Assistance Authority to determine eligibility for the state grant program called the Tuition Aid Grant. So you don't have to worry about a separate state aid application. And then you have other sources, things like athletic scholarships. If your, students, if your student plays a sport and is going to a school that offers athletic scholarships, Outside scholarships, Mrs. Nectarline already talked about the resources right on the Hunter and Central website for outside scholarships. Veterans benefits, if I have any veterans out there, you may be able to transfer your eligibility to your student. For those students um, going to college where they're living on campus, in future years, they may be able to be a resident assistant. That means they're living in a residence hall and managing um, a floor of students, and that does come with some monetary compensation. There are also tax credits available for higher education. Uh, you can take a look at publication 970 from the IRS. Their website is just irs.gov. And uh, the tax benefits for higher educa for education uh, uh, publication will give you all the information on the tax credits and deductions. I do recommend talking with your tax preparer about your eligibility for these items. Uh, even if you use something like a TurboTax for your taxes, it will calculate your eligibility and determine which works best for your specific financial situation. So we're reviewing all those 15 financial aid award letters that we received. We wanna understand what's on the letter. What is this telling me? So you need to understand the types of aid that it might have listed. So. 
if you see money that says grant after it. That means it does not have to be repaid. Grants are generally awarded based on financial need, not all the time, but in general. But again, free money does not have to be repaid. You may see federal work study. The FAFSA is the application for the federal work study program and it allows the student to work and earn money while they're in school. If you see something that says loan on the end of it, it does have to be repaid. Um, there are loans available through the federal government. I'm going to talk a little bit more about them in a few minutes, but know that that's money that is borrowed and, doesn't have to, and has to be repaid. And finally, scholarships. Anything that's a scholarship on the end of it, that too is free money. And this slide shows it as earned money because you have earned that scholarship based on your grades or your test scores or your talents or your characteristics that are unique to you. So that's in that sense, that's why it's earned, but scholarships do not have to be repaid. So grants, scholarships do not have to be repaid. Okay. So from the federal government, um, and in the handouts that Mrs. Nectarline posted, there is a uh, multi-page handout from the federal government that includes descriptions of the federal grant programs and the federal loan program. So I'm not going to go too deeply into them tonight because you have the information to review. But the main grant program is the federal Pell Grant. Maximum uh, this year is $6,495 for full-time study. Federal Supplemental Education Opportunity Grant can be awarded for up to $4,000 generally to students who also receive the Pell Grant. One thing to note about the supplemental grant is that it can run out. Schools have a limited amount, so that's why deadlines are important, because even if you're eligible and you apply too late, if the money's gone, it's gone. And there's also the teach grant, not need-based, um, for students interested in teaching in high-need subject areas in low-income districts, and there is a teaching component required after they graduate to maintain the teach grant. All those are federal. Uh, one of the other handouts that I provided was information on the New Jersey Tuition Aid Grant or TAG program. This is the state's need-based grant program for New Jersey residents that remain in New Jersey for college. There's also the NJ STARS program that allows students in the top 15% of their class to go to their local community college with their tuition and fees paid for. There's a part two to NJ STARS. So if you complete NJ STARS 1 successfully and meet all the criteria, you can potentially move on into NJ Stars 2 at a four year institution, any of them in New Jersey, and receive up to a $2,500 scholarship. And finally, the EOF program or Educational Opportunity Fund program is for students who are both academically and uh, financially disadvantaged. Okay, we kind of covered the um, outside scholarships in the beginning, so always think local. So when the information about the local scholarships comes out in February, I believe it was, be sure that your student um, gets in it to win it. Uh, and then also that you're using um, the web for a further reach. The two websites I have on here are in the list that's on the 100 and Central website. Main thing when searching for scholarships, don't pay. You don't need to pay to search a scholarship database. You don't need to pay to apply for a scholarship. There are plenty of legitimate resources that are free. So just make sure that you're using free resources. Okay, employment. So as I said, the FAFSA is the application for the federal work study program. If your student is eligible, it should be listed on the financial aid award offer. It allows students to work on campus um, and at community service locations and earn money while they're in school. If your student does not qualify for federal work study, they can certainly ask their college if there are any other ways to work on campus if they don't qualify for work study. And then certainly off-campus jobs are an option as well. So loan programs. You've exhausted all of your scholarship and grant resources, You've gotten everything that you can get, but you still, you still have a gap. You still need more assistance. What can you do? So there is the federal direct loan program. This is a federal loan program for students. With the direct loan program, students are the borrowers of the loans. There is no co-signer and no credit check involved. And they may also be able to qualify for some funding uh, that does not accrue interest while they're in school. For first year students, the maximum they can borrow is $5,500. This does go up in subsequent years, so they can borrow $6,500 as a sophomore and then $7,500 in their junior and senior year. So that does add up to 
quite a bit when you put all, if they're in school for four years, put that all together. So we do recommend that students maximize that direct loan first. If more is needed, then you have options through either the Federal Parent PLUS loan or a private loan. Parent PLUS is a credit-based loan for parents from the federal government. Um, so you apply directly with the federal government, they will do the credit check and let you know whether or not you're approved. Parent is the borrower and the parent is the one responsible for repayment. And then there are also private education loans offered by various banks, lenders, credit unions. Um, they have loan options that students can borrow with a credit worthy cosigner. First year students really do need to be prepared to have someone that can either borrow for them or be a cosigner and really should be prepared for that for all the years that they're in school. Um, some private education lenders do have a parent loan product to go head to head with the Parent PLUS loan from the federal government. So there are multiple options um, out there. One thing to note, Parent PLUS loans and private education loans, you can borrow those loans up to the cost of attendance that I talked about in the beginning. So if you need to not only cover the costs, the charges on the bill, but you need to borrow extra money for books or transportation or living expenses, you can do so through um, either the PLUS loan or a private education loan. Obviously it is a loan, so it will have to be repaid, um, but if you do need those excess funds, you can borrow to cover those items. I also have some information on something that's not necessarily financial aid, but may be a way to help you finance your student's education. The college may have a tuition payment plan, and this is a way for you to make monthly installments toward the tuition. It's not a loan, so there's no interest. There may be an enrollment fee um, for the servicing of the plan, but again, no interest. This may be a way for you to fit your payments into your monthly budget. Um, generally, there are some different payment options, whether you want the money um, uh, taken from a bank account, you want to put it on a credit card because you do want to um, keep building up your frequent flyer miles for when you're ready to fly again, when there are actually flights that aren't being canceled. Um, so, um, but just know that that's a possibility too. Uh, let's see, okay. So I told you I would have some tips at the end. So always read, 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 read. Please read everything. Make sure to read all mail and email promptly. I know a lot of stuff is coming in, but you do want to make sure you just take a look at everything. Is this something we have to fill out? Is there a deadline? Because again, you don't want to miss out on something because you missed a deadline. Read instructions carefully. The FAFSA has a lot of instructions. It has that additional help. While yes, you can correct most things, if it's correct from the beginning, it will be a much smoother process all the way through. And then review anything before submitting for accuracy, again, just to make sure that things are correct upon submission. And keep copies of everything. Before you submit the FAFSA, you'll be able to review everything before submitting. You can print it, save it, whatever you'd like to do. If you're borrowing loans, make sure to keep copies of promissory notes. That's the promise to repay that loan. It has all the fine print on it. So you do wanna make sure you're keeping that. Also, involve students in the financial aid process. Remember, the FAFSA is in the student's name. When you start to get those financial aid award offers, they're addressed directly to the student, not to the parents of. When the bill comes out next summer, it is only addressed to the student, not to the parents of, because the student is the one going to school. Yes, we understand there are people helping, um, but ultimately it is the student's responsibility to make sure that their business is all in order. Um, parents, you should also be aware that there is a privacy law, a federal one that kicks in when students are in college and it keeps all their education records private. But do not panic. Schools have a way for students to waive their rights and be able to release the information to you. But this does include their academics, so grades. It includes financial information, so financial aid and billing information as well as disciplinary information. So know that that's a conversation to have next summer. Um, usually the financial part's not too difficult because students do want that assistance with the financial part. The academics and the grades, that's a little bit more difficult. When you have questions, talk to the financial aid office. We're here to help you. We're here to help you for free. So again, when you, you're not sure of something, even if you think it's a silly question, just ask us. And 
today, you can contact a financial aid office in so many different ways. For example, my office alone, we're open, so you can come in in person. You can call us on the phone, you can send us an email, you could send us a fax, you could put something in the mail to us. So you've got a multitude of ways to reach out to us. So don't be afraid to do that. You wanna check and make sure we receive something. Peace of mind, not, don't hesitate to reach out and talk to us if you need to. Or if you have some sort of special circumstance that you want us to review or understand how we would handle it, again, don't forget to, don't be afraid to reach out to us. And finally, some questions that you'll want to ask as you're moving uh, further into the financial aid process. Your student has now qualified for an institutional scholarship or a grant. That's wonderful. Is this something that's renewable? So is it money we can count on from year to year? Is it a one-time thing? If your student gets a scholarship, there may be a GPA requirement for renewal, so you want to know what is the GPA requirement up front, so it's not a surprise um, when it comes for review time. Your student is eligible for federal work study. What are the uh, policies that surround a job? Where might you work? Is a job guaranteed? How much might you earn um, in that position? Um, so good things to ask and to understand um, how you might be able to take advantage of that program. Congratulations, you have received the Flemington Rotary Club Scholarship. In all the years that I've been here, I've never actually asked if there really is a Rotary Club, but if there is, yes, there is one. So actually someone may receive that award. So you've received this scholarship. You do need to ask the financial aid office, how might this affect the other aid you've already offered me? Um, so it could change aid that you have, it may not, but that is something that's gonna be very school specific to ask. You opted to borrow that Parent PLUS loan and you included money for books. Is there a way for your student to use that money directly so that they don't have to put out cash? So good question to ask. And then if there's been a change in your circumstance, whether there's been a job loss, a loss of some sort of untaxed benefit or some other change in your circumstance, reach out to us and let us know. Um, we do have a way to address um, changes in circumstances. Um, you may hear it called a special circumstance, an appeal, professional judgment. It goes by a few different names, but it's all the same. Um, what we'll need to do um, is whatever your situation is, the school will need to document the situation. So just telling us that something changed, and that won't be enough. We will need proper documentation. We'll review the documentation that you submit. Determine if your circumstance is something that we'll approve, and then if so, we'll um, recalculate income, we'll correct, uh, we'll change the FAFSA for you. You don't do anything. That's why I stress in the beginning. Always complete your FAFSA the way that it's asked for. So if it's 2020 income, that's what you need to put on it. If anything will change um, with that, it'll be done by the financial aid office based on documentation that you've submitted. Um, and all schools have a little bit different way and timing that they'll, that they'll handle a special circumstance, but know that it is possible to have changes addressed. Um, okay, so guess what? We made it to the end. So now I know I'm going to be getting some assistance here because test, test, test. we've got questions coming in from the virtual land. We do. The real do. land. Okay. So okay. are we still good back there, um, Jim, with our live stream? Excellent. Okay. So we've got, we've got a lot of people watching from home. Thank you for those of you watching from home. Am I good here? Am I in the view, Jim? <laughs> oh, should I? Or Am I halfway over? in? Um, so we're going to try to to do this sort of, um, we have a lot coming in from home. And okay. certainly, so maybe while I get sort of set here, did you want to take one or two from the audience? I know sure. you're not going to head out there. But certainly, no. we got hands going up. So okay. those of you at home, we're going to take some from the audience for a moment. We will try to get to most Back of these forth. coming in from home. I, obviously, the Google form is working well. <laughs> um, and some of these on the Google form may have come from those of you here at the audience. So we'll start with the audience. Go ahead. Okay, so I've got right here in like kind of like the white with the black mask. Yep, you. <laughs> So the question is about, does the college change aid you might receive from year to year based on changes in income information? 
It is possible. It really depends upon what the aid that the college offered was based on. So, for instance, if it was a merit-based scholarship, it m probably won't change. I can tell you specifically for Monmouth, we have merit-based scholarships. They have nothing to do with the FAFSA. So whether you file or don't or something changes, the student can still receive that same amount. But if there's need-based aid involved, yes, that could go up and down as your income changes from year to year. Okay. All right. um, if it's okay, Kristen, yes. we're going to go ahead and take, I know there's going to be more from the audience, but um, we are growing rapidly oh, here no. on the, on the form. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to go ahead and I do apologize if you answered some of these, but people okay. from home are asking we'll lots of different questions. So a lot about 529s and 529s in grandparent names. So if a grandparent set up a 529, does it need to be reported? And if so, how? Uh, here's another one. Grandma and grandpa have a 529 and the college student's the beneficiary. Does that have to be included as an asset on the FAFSA? So, no, that's why I was mentioning in the yeah. beginning that for investment purposes, it's only the plans owned by the student or owned by the parent. If it's owned by grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins, lovely neighbors, I don't know, um, then it's not reported as, uh, as an investment. Um, when you do take a distribution from a plan owned by like a grandparent, aunt, or uncle in subsequent years, you are supposed to report that as income, but that's totally different from reporting it as an investment. So again, for the investment side of things, it's just plans owned by students and owned by parents. Okay, I'm gonna take two more and then we'll go back to you guys here live. Okay. This is quite a back and forth, but I think I can answer both of these. Is the presentation gonna be uploaded? And li Well, we're live streaming right now. Um, and then this will be available on our YouTube channel, right, Jim? So if those of you that want to rewatch and learn more about financial aid at another time, you can. And then there was another question. Can I get an early estimate of, um, of, of my fa like of early FAFSA estimates? So two things I'm going to recommend, and correct me if I'm wrong, Kristen, the net price calculators that are on college and university websites are a great place to plug in your income and asset numbers and get an idea of your um, overall cost through there. And then the FAFSA forecaster. Yes, which still is, yeah, exists. So okay. That's what I had. So net price okay. calculator is going to be college specific. So it's the aid eligibility at that particular college or university. If you're using the federal student aid estimator, that's just going to give you an early estimate of the expected family contribution and pet uh, potential federal student aid eligibility. So a little different. Um, uh, uh, reasons for using both of these items and like I said I recommend the student aid estimator for like junior and sophomore families since senior families you're going to get the same information when you complete the FAFSA for real okay any others from here because they're just uh, we were going to stay keep keep um just keep for distance if, if that's okay yes yes are there any others here go ahead Sure. So the question is about um, what are you like have a you're the custodian of accounts for all like your children. Yeah. So only so the way that it works with custodial accounts. Ah, I went a little too fast there. Sorry about <laughs> that. And I really didn't need to yell that loud either. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, uh, so with custodial bank accounts, they actually the owner is the student. So it is reported as a student asset, and we only need to worry about that for the student that's completing this FAFSA. The siblings, they'll report theirs as it's their turn to do their FAFSA. Okay. Okay. Oh, oh. In the yeah. Sure. So you. Um, if you do have to provide information about assets on the FAFSA, one of the questions will be, as of the day you complete the FAFSA, how much do you have in cash, savings, and checking accounts? And that's for both student and parent. Um, no, it's, that would be personal accounts. The, the business is the business if it's... Um, uh, you know, uh, as I said, family owned and controlled with 100 or fewer employees, then you wouldn't have to worry about that checking account. Yeah, correct. But you'd have to, but any personal ones, those would go on. 
Okay, I'm gonna. Um, I've got like almost thirty coming oh in, so I'm thinking, Ooh, and they're wow. covering folks a, a wide, wide range of topics. So okay. if you're okay with it, Kristen, I'm just gonna go ahead and start let's, rattling off some. Let's go. Um, right. Okay, is there an added benefit to having more than one child in college at the same time? Um, that has been canceled in the latest FAFSA update, and I'm just reading word for word. Bear with yes. me. So um, yes, go ahead. So currently, the way that the FAFSA is, it does ask for the number in college, and yes, if it is more than one, it will reduce the expected family contribution. This is something, however, that is changing, just not yet. Um, there is some FAFSA simplification that's coming down the road. At this point, it has been moved to the 24-25 school year, so it's not happening yet. So I say if you've got students, go take advantage of what you can while you can. And then obviously, if I'm still coming here, when those changes come into effect, I would certainly let everyone know about them. And then if your student's already in school, when those go into effect, the financial aid office would be making um, that information available um, as well. But currently, yes, you can. Um, report the multiple children in college, and it is taken into consideration in the expected family contribution. Okay. Assuming moderate income, is having both parents retired an advantage for financial aid? Um, no, I don't think there's any advantage to someone retiring. I mean, you'll still have to report on the FAFSA if you're retired and you're collecting from your retirement accounts that's still going to be reported through your adjusted gross income. Um, if you're collecting, um, uh, the only thing as far as retirement, if you're old enough to receive um, the untaxed social security benefits, those aren't reported on the FAFSA, but that's just, that's for everybody. There's no untaxed uh, social security benefits reported, but again, if you're collecting from your retirement account, or if you then also then get, you know, chapter two of your life, you get another job, something like that. Again, that'll all be reported. Okay. Anyone out here? Okay, I'm going to keep, okay, oh, go right ahead. Right here. No, so there's really not a lot of spot for debt, and, not, and certainly not consumer debt on the FAFSA. And remember, on the FAFSA, you're not reporting, your home is not counted at all. So a mortgage, you're not reporting any value to your home, so you're not reporting any debt on your home. Um, nothing like personal loans, car loans, none of that is reported on the FAFSA. The only um, place really that debt is counted is if you do have um, uh, property outside of the home that you live in. So for instance, you have a shore house down in my area. If you have that, then yes, you can count the mortgage toward that property because that actually has to be reported on the FAFSA. Um, but really outside of that, no, no credit card debt or anything like that. Okay. Uh, what happens if you inherited a lot of money in 2020? Would that skew our income? Uh, potentially could. It depends upon where you have the money. Is it in, you know, is it in the bank? Is it you know, um, uh, was it something that, that will show up on your taxes? Did you put it into a retirement account? There's a lot of questions around that, depending mm -hmm. upon where, you know, where it is. And then potentially, you know, that may be something that you can address with the, with the college about whether they might exclude it. Again, I think that really depends upon um, where it is. Okay, so if the person who asked that is still listening from home wants to enter that, we might be able to get you a little more information, but I'm gonna move on here if we're okay to. Um, when completing the FAFSA parent income, we have to enter net worth, which includes invest investments, et cetera. I have multiple 529s, one for a student, one for a sibling. Do we include the 529 for the student in this amount? And do we exclude the siblings 529 amount? Nope. So parent, if you're if you're the parent and you're owning, you're the owner of both of the plans for both siblings, you need to add up what you have in each of the accounts and put the grand total on the FAFSA. Okay. I feel a little well, bit like I'm on a game show or something. I feel like I feel like your Especially spokesperson like right now. And I really me. hope this is working well for everybody <laughs> at home. We're just sort of winging it, so bear with us. Um, what if you own another home and sell it between filing the FAFSA and your child going to school? Uh, that would be something to address with the college to see, you know, they may, they may um, uh, exclude it if you show the proof that it's been sold, but that, again, something to address at the college level. Okay. 
This is a more general one because we're talking about this a lot with our seniors, telling them to keep their college list long, like oh. even the schools they're still kind of thinking about because we'd rather send documents and help them complete an application rather than undersend. So this kind of goes with that. Should I send the FAFSA? So add colleges to the FAFSA of schools they're not 100% sure they're applying to. Yes, I yes. always recommend to do so. Remember, the FAFSA is free. So the FAFSA itself is free. You're not having to pay for each college. Send it because this, if, in a, if a, the eventuality is one of those you know, ones that you weren't so sure about becomes the first choice, then they have it, and then that won't hold up any awarding because they'll have already have the FAFSA. So, yes, I say go, ahead, go forth and send to schools. Right. And Kristen had showed in the slideshow, and it's also a very easy Google search of what to do when you have more than 10 colleges on the FAFSA. So um, I will jump to this one. To apply for most scholarships, do you need to have a completed FAFSA? I will tell you for our local scholarships here at Central, the answer is no. But yeah, no, I, I mean, so. I think I, I also... Um, handle some stuff at the university that deals with outside scholarships and no for the most part that you didn't you don't there may be some outside scholarships out there that do want to take financial need into consideration so they may want um, a copy of the FAFSA they may want some income documents but I would say that probably a lot of those they probably don't have deadlines until the springtime so that you would have it done and it would have been already you know completed by the time it becomes an issue Okay. Okay. Um, if completing a FAFSA, are the parents automatically eligible for a direct plus loan? What's the current rate and is there a limit? Sure. So question is about plus loans and is a parent automatically eligible for it? No, a parent is not automatically eligible for it. It is a credit-based loan. Yes, the credit criteria um, is less stringent than with private loans. Um, plus loans aren't looking at a credit score. There's no employment requirement, no income to debt ratio, but it is still looking to see, are you, um, you know, are you 90 days or more delinquent on any accounts? Are you in bankruptcy, uh, open collection, those types of things. Um, so as far as are you automatically eligible? No. And each time that you want to borrow, you do need to put through an application because the credit check does need to be done. And then we it was asked about the interest rate. Uh, is there uh, the, what's the current rate and is there a limit? Okay, so the current rate for this school year, um, I was just <laughs> updating this on our website today, it's 6.28%. It's a fixed rate. There's also an origination fee on a PLUS loan. That's money that the federal government keeps, um, not the university. Um, and the origination fee f is currently 4.228%. So the federal government keeps 4.228% of each disbursement of a PLUS loan. Um, rates, while fixed, they do change every year. So 6.28 is the rate for any loans that are um, borrowed during the 21-22 school year. By June, we should have the rate for 22-23. It again will be fixed. Um, it's based on the 10-year Treasury bill auction that occurs in May. And then each loan, whether it's... Um, the direct loan subsidized, unsubsidized, unsubsidized for graduate students or plus loans, there'll be a margin added to that T-bill auction and that will determine the rate for the next year. In case anybody really wanted to know that much in detail. Um, and is there a maximum? The maximum is the cost of attendance minus other aid that the student is receiving. Um, so we would take that overall cost to attend figure that includes the, the extra money like the books and the personal and things like that Subtract out all the other aid that the student is receiving. Whatever's left, that's the maximum amount, whether it's a PLUS loan or a private loan. Okay, we have a question in the back. back. Sure, the question is about receiving child support, and does that have to be reported on the FAFSA? Yes, it does. There is a section for um, different types of untaxed income, and that's where you'll find um, it's child support received during 2020. Okay, I have a question regarding divorced and separated categories. Yes. Um, person is asking, if I understand correctly, I must gather all of my ex's assets in addition to my own, including their names and values. If legally divorced, I'm, no, right? So, on the FAFSA, again, we're using, um, if, if the student lives with one parent more than the other, then we're going with the custodial parent. 
and then it's only that parent's information that goes on the FAFSA. So it, uh, depending upon which parent it is, then that's the one whose assets goes on it, not the other one. Now, that's for FAFSA purposes. If that student is looking at profile schools, they th that ask for that CSS profile, um, that can ask for non-custodial parent information. And so it could be collected through that purpose versus the FAFSA. So again, depends upon the application. Okay. Is a public worker's pension counted on the FAFSA? This is info that would be reporting using the data retrieval tool. Public so, worker's pension counted on the FAFSA. Well, uh, it should not be counted as an investment, but if the person is receiving, is, is already drawing from the pension, then yes, mm -hmm. it would be because it, it, it would um, go over because that would be part of your income. Okay. Uh, we have a 529 question. You may have answered this, though. Um, 529 college savings account for a younger sibling who is not going to college yet reported. No. The, it, it doesn't matter where the other siblings are. If the parent or parents that own the plan are going on this FAFSA, you have to add up all the plans for all the people in the household. So it doesn't matter if the kid is five years old and you have one that's going off to college. You'd have to add them both together. There's that answer. Um, can parent 401k monies be used for tuition without penalty? Okay. Ha ha. I have my double secret answer for that one. <laughs> ha. So I believe so, but again, I do recommend people, you know, talking with professionals. I am not an accountant. I am not a certified financial planner or anything, but apparently there is um, a way to take a distribution from your IRA before you reach age 59 and a half and not have to pay the additional 10% tax. Um, so as long as you're paying for qualified education expenses, whether it's for yourself, your spouse, uh, child, that type of thing. So yes, it may be possible. I do not all know all the steps to do that, but if you are um, under 59 and a half and want to do that for qualified education expenses, you can um, withdraw without the 10% additional tax. You can read about it. I have information that's from the IRS so you can um, read through that or talk with your, um, uh, also with your, um, I would say with the uh, plan administrator for your IRA to see how that, how that works. Okay, they just keep coming in. Um, I already completed the FAFSA. Should I have gotten an email confirmation from the FAFSA, sure. from the government? So as far as completing the FAFSA and when it's complete, like when do you find out? If you provided email addresses on the FAFSA, you should get notified by email within about three to five business days of completing the FAFSA that it's been completed. Um, if you're not seeing that, you might want to check maybe, you know, your spam folder just to be on the safe side. Um, or you can always try to log back into the application and if you're able to access it, then it means it's done. Because if something is processing, you wouldn't be able to like get in and make any other sort of correction or change or anything like that. Okay. Um, does the FAFSA automatically transfer to the state of New Jersey or is there anything anyone has to do? No, no longer any extra questions for the state. So that will um, automatically happen and then um, the state does have, um, they take the data from the FAFSA, but they apply their own formula to it. Um, and they have their own online system where students can check their status. If they need to provide additional documentation, it would be listed there as well. Um, so, uh, so no, none, no, additional, no additional action at the point you're completing the FAFSA. For state aid, there may be steps that have to be taken a little bit later on in the process. Okay. I won't be eligible for selective service until March. Will this affect my ability for New Jersey financial aid? Oh, sure. With the selective service part in New Jersey, the main thing, the thing is, is that you do need to be registered in order for us to actually disperse the aid. So that's plenty of time. If you're turning 18 in March, you can go ahead, sign up through the selective service website, which is just sss.gov. Um, it'll take a I think a couple of weeks maybe for it to process. You'll have that um, documentation. So if a school does ask for it prior to 
um, you know, uh, m the dispersing or may I call it making the money real, um, then you can provide that information to your school. Okay. Um, I'll try to take the next one about scholarships, but certainly, Kristen, if you have anything, should I focus on specific scholarships that apply more to my talent um, or submit as many, quote, no essay, no transcript scholarships? So that's, that's really two different questions because there's scholarships that have criteria, so they match you by your talent, your major, the region you're going to, activities you've pursued in high school, and then there's requirements. So I think that perhaps the the person asking sort of blended the two. Um, I would focus less on requirements because chances are the requirements for most scholarships are not going to be terribly different than applying to college. Transcripts, SAT scores, and the reusing and recycling of all the beautiful essays that we are reading right now should be used for scholarships. So put the requirements aside, seniors, and focus on the ones that match you best. So if you are an instrumental player, a vocalist, um, an athlete, a student who can show two to 300 hours of community service but has to write an essay about it, chances are you're already probably piecing together something like that for your college apps and supplements. So I would focus less on requirements um, and don't just look for the no transcript, no essay ones and focus more on the ones that match the qualities that you can show on the application. Um, I'm going to switch gears here to... Um, this, there was a question, does the student have to apply to all the schools listed on the FAFSA? No, we, uh, we had recommended to add the ones that are, you're still even on the fence about, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Yep. Um, should individual colleges acknowledge that they've received my FAFSA? Depends. I mean, uh, I know at, for Monmouth, we don't send out anything that says, hey, we got this. If you do get your... Um, uh, you get your confirmation, you've double checked that you've listed the school on it, they should receive it. If you feel you want to double check, you can always um, reach out, call, email the school and just make sure that they have um, received it. Okay. Um, I have a son in graduate school for which we are paying. Will that count for us on the FAFSA? We are still his primary residence, though he is in another state during the semesters. All right, so that's household size. Let's take a look at some household size information and get to my notes on that. Okay, so, so for household size, it's your parents' other children, even if they do not live with your parent, if A, your parents will provide more than half of their support between July 1, 2022 and June 30th, 2023, or the children could answer no to every question in step three. That would not happen because they're in grad school. So as long as in that situation, those parents will continue to provide more than half of the support um, from July 1, 2022 to June 30th, 2023 for the graduate student, then they can still be part of the household. Okay, we still have a lot of people watching, but questions are starting to slow a little bit. Does this process differ in any way for applying to community college? Oh, no. If you're going to community college, I would still say, you know, at least for the first year, it's my same advice that I give, whether it's two-year, four-year, trade school, whatever you're planning to do, to always apply for everything for that first year and see what, what happens. If the aid that you've decided to accept and what you want moving forward does not require the FAFSA, then don't file it after that. Um, and I also say particular, and if there's no changes in your situation, certainly if something has changed, then you might want to complete it and see what that um, change in circumstances does for the student's aid eligibility. But no, community colleges will still accept a FAFSA um, and they'll still determine um, your eligibility. I know a lot of times at community colleges, there may be extra steps and extra things to fill out if you do want to borrow loans, because I know a lot of community college want to really try to keep students borrowing to the minimum possible. Um, so that may be some extra signing of things that you might need to do. Okay. Um, do retired parents receiving Social Security have any advantage in determining financial need? Um, so... As I said before, untaxed Social Security benefits are not reported on the FAFSA, but again, and what you're receiving through your retirement accounts, that is going to be reported. So, I mean, it depends. If you have really good retirement accounts and you're basically getting almost the same amount of money as you made when you were working, 
you know, that's going to affect the aid eligibility. Retirement itself is not something that, uh, it's not even asked for on the FAFSA. I mean, in that sense, like, are you retired is not asking that. Um, but there is places that it can be, you know, it would be reported if you're collecting from your retirement accounts. Okay. Are bonds received as gifts considered assets? Yes, bonds are investments. Um, and you'll need to find out what they're worth the day that you're going to complete the FAFSA. I had some families at another school say they had already tried to go to the bank to get the how much they were worth, and they told them they have to go maybe on a, a federal, like the bond website, something like that, to find out the information. But yes, um, bonds are considered an investment. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, did I hear you say that the UTMA and UGA accounts mm -hmm. in trust for the child, did they get listed as child or parent So yes, assets? The, the custodial accounts, UGMA, UTMA, UTMA. that they're called, um, those are an asset of the student. The parent is only the, or whoever is only the custodian, the owner of that actual account is the student. So it is reported as a student um, asset in the cash savings checking accounts. Okay, we are closing in on 8 p.m. We are going to take one to two more. Um, are all students required to register for selective service? No longer. No. Well, and even with selective service, selective service is for males between the ages of 18 and 26. Um, it's no longer required for federal aid eligibility for those students. It is only needed if the student is... Um, potentially going to be receiving any aid through the state of New Jersey, whether it be a New Jersey um, scholarship, the New Jersey grant program, or even taking advantage of the uh, NJ class supplemental loan, which can be used out of state as well as in state. Okay. If grandma lives with us but supports herself, files her own taxes, do we need to report her income? Then, no, her income? No, not at all. And I, based on that description, she wouldn't even be part of the household size. Because, again, for other people that are living in the household, um, they have to be supported more than 50% to be counted as part of the household. So if you just, like, maybe combined households to save money, you're paying your bills, they're paying their bills, that kind of thing, um, then and no one's supporting the other, then they're not part of the household size either. Okay. And we have one in the back here. Oh, Yes. Uh, you probably My, know that so the me. question was, does the, does the CSS profile their deadlines for the schools align with admission deadlines? I, I don't know for sure. My suggestion would be to let it, let it align. Mrs. Blake, you might have more insight. Yeah, so just to recap for those at home, the CSS profile, much more detailed, lengthier. Um, I would say we're looking at about 200 to 250 schools requiring it. Um, I think the list is about there. And I will say consistently, it's usually pretty pricey private schools. Not always, um, but that's where it usually tends to be. But to answer your question, I would try to align it with, with the admission deadlines because your, your main deadline's probably not too far off from that. Um, there was one I missed at the very top. I'm sorry to this person who asked earlier. This is my second child going to school. My older one will be a senior in college next year. I'd like to get a loan for her senior year under her own name. How does this work? As a 20-year-old, can she apply as a non-dependent for federal aid? Um, most likely not being able to be an independent student. Um, the age to be independent is 24. Um, and then you'd have the student has to meet the other criteria that I had, if I can get back to it quickly, information out here. So it's being uh, 24 or older, being married, 
armed forces, being active duty, veteran, having both parents deceased in foster care, dependent or ward of the court, emancipated minor, legal guardianship, master's or doctorate program, and then having kids or having dependents or being homeless. So I don't think that any of those are gonna necessarily apply to the student. So they can still complete a FAFSA. They can, and a student can um, take advantage of the federal direct loan for that senior year. It would be, if they're senior, it would be 7,500 that they can borrow free and clear. Um, and then you could potentially take a look at maybe a private loan where the student would borrow and then having parent be co-signer so that when the loan does go into repayment, the first person that they're asking for the payments from is the student. Okay, so that concludes what came in. I may leave that form open, anybody who's still watching from home um, through the evening, and if anything really pressing comes in tomorrow, I will go ahead and touch base with Kristen and try to put some FAQs together. Um, if you do throw a question in there after we, we um, end our stream tonight, go ahead and throw your name in if you don't mind. That way I can get back to you um, personally. But anything else from our, our in-person audience? Okay, we just right. kindly ask that we, we don't um, come up and do any, any close-up personal questions. But thank you guys for sticking yes, it out. Thanks for coming. Many, Staying many thanks <laughs> to our speaker, Kristen Isaacson. We're small, but maybe mighty in our applause. <laughs> um, and we had a lot of good um, questions and participants at home. But thank you all so much. As always, stay in touch with the counselors if there's anything we can do to help you. Thank you. Have a great night. And thank you for tuning in at home.